Hello and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Nick Hodges. I'm the CTO of Griller. I'm your host today and welcome everyone to this Griller Presents all about improving participant engagement. Uh, so to get started, before we get straight into our content, I want to do a, a few things with you to get us going. So first of all, in Zoom, you should have the chat bar. Can everyone open the chat bar and in the little tube at the bottom, set it to everyone? Um, I'm gonna, we're going to have a few bits where we type in the chat a lot. If you've been to one of our Grilla Presents in the past, you know that we do this. Uh, so I want you to get comfortable using it. So everyone open the chat, uh, set the setting to everyone. And first thing, just put in what your, your name and where you're coming in from, country or university, anything is fine. Uh, so stick that in the chat now. And let's see some coming through. Um, we've got Anna from Stockholm, uh, Jake from Oxford, Canada, uh, Swansea, UCL, Switzerland, uh, the States, fantastic Germany, Bristol, shout out to my old university, thank you very much, uh, Nottingham Trent, uh, Middlesex, wonderful, brilliant, thank you so much, it's lovely to see you all here. Um, all right, second thing to put into the chat is, um, what worries you when it comes to participant engagement? When you're, when you're designing a study or running it, what's, what, are, what are the big concerns that you have uh, when you put it online uh, about how your participants are going to behave or, or what, how that's going to affect your data quality? So in the chat, what is, your, uh, what is uh, your number one worry when it comes to participant engagement? Not paying attention to the instructions, uh, dishonesty, uh, in a tent of responding, multitasking. Um, yes, absolutely, <laughs> faking it to get money. Uh, yeah, okay. And um, getting bored, shirking. Yes, absolutely. Um, fantastic, all good stuff. We're gonna be covering all of those things and more. Um, and finally, one of the, uh, boredom. Um, that's, that's in that array. Um, and then finally, the last thing I want to ask you all is, um, uh, I know we often have a mixture of people who are kind of new to this whole space and people who have experienced and done quite a lot of it. So if you are new to online research and here because you want to learn how to do it well and how these kind of things can help you out, put new in the chat. And if you've done loads of it before, but you're looking to figure out how you can make it better, please put better in the chat. So if you're new, put new. If you're, if you're trying to make it better, put better. Um, nice. Oh, it's a good spread, a good mixture of news and betters. Um, old. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> yes. Uh, I know the feeling. Um, fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for putting those in. We'll be uh, doing some more stuff uh, in the chat in a bit. Um, so as you know, this session is all about improving participant engagement and getting better quality data as a result. Um, I'm going to open with kind of bold statement here and say that I think online behavioral search is now a mainstream. It's now a mainstream way of doing things. Uh, certainly we've been at this for about 10 years now. And certainly in the early days, there were some like big unknowns in this whole space. Um, you know, can you even get reliable timing in the browser? Will people taking part at home even do it properly at all? How could you possibly tell? So fast forward to today, and I think it's fair to say we've answered these kind of big initial questions. Uh, there's now a hefty amount of published research uh, from online studies showing that yes, the browser is a robust and predictable environment in which you can run studies. And yes, we can reliably get good quality participants to take part in our studies properly. So we know this stuff works. So now our focus turns to saying, how do we get the best out of it? How can we get the best data quality that we can? And of course, that's why we're all here uh, today. Um, so we have two speakers who are going to address this from two different angles. We've got Andrew Gordon from Prolific, who's going to tell you all about how they provide you with good quality participants. And Joe Evershed from Gorilla is going to tell you how you can design your studies for maximum engagement. So welcome to you both. Um, I've got a yeah, couple of bits. Here. Hello and hello, Andrew. Uh, good that, you're, that we can see you there as well. Um, so to set the scene. Um, <clears throat> So to set the scene, you could think of your data quality overall as, a, as almost like a pipeline with five stages. There's your audience supply. That's the pool of people that you're going to pick from. Uh, there's your audience targeting and screening. That's how, how you decide which of the people from your overall pool you're going to invite to take part. Then there's the study design itself. Um, this is the, uh, the controls you put in place to make sure you get the data that you want. Uh, the participant experience. What's it like to take part in? How long does it take? Is it fun? And finally, the data cleaning at the end, how you decide which participants to exclude. So if you're taking notes, um, 
I would recommend get a piece of paper and write out those five stages of the pipeline at the top. So that it's easy to keep your various takeaways in context. I'll give you a couple of moments to do that. Um, and while you are, I'll leave those titles at the top uh, for those wanting to write them down. While you're doing that, we are running a promo code for this event. So if you've not tried Gorilla Out and you'd like to give it a go, then use this promo code when uh, when signing up. Uh, this is Gorilla Presents Engagement, so GPENG for Gorilla Presents Engagements 2022. Uh, and during the sign up process, there's a button where you can say, I have a promo code where you can enter that in. And that'll give you 50 match funding tokens that you can claim on your first purchase. Uh, so stick that on your bit of paper as well. And uh, I'll leave that at the top as well. And finally, as many of you know, we help run a big conference in the summer called Be Online. It's completely virtual like this, all live streamed. Um, and uh, it's a methods conference all about online behavioral research. Uh, so there's always loads of great speakers taking you behind the curtain and showing you how they run their studies. So make a note of that as well. Um, I'll give you another sec to write all that down. Um, OK, so finally, if you have any questions, if you go to your Zoom Q&A, you should find this little Q&A section. Please put your questions in there. The panel will try and answer some as we go. We'll obviously do questions for each of the speakers and then a few more at the end. Um, but put them in there because then we can make sure that we, we can try and answer them. So with all that in place, um, on to our first speaker. So uh, Andrew from Prolific. Andrew, welcome. Uh, do you go ahead and share your screen and over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. Let me share my screen here. Please tell me if you can't see it for any reason. We see the slides. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's good. good. Great. Brilliant. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me uh, and good evening to everyone in the UK or morning to everyone in the US. Uh, my name is Andrew Gordon. I'm a research consultant here at Prolific, which essentially means I help researchers like yourselves run their studies successfully on Prolific. Uh, my background is in psychology, so I did my PhD in cognitive neuroscience at the University of Bristol, so nice to see that there's some Bristol people in the chat, and I did a couple of years of postdoc experience at the University of California, Davis, before coming to work for Prolific. Uh, and today, so I'm going to be talking basically about how Prolific selects for the most high quality and engaged participants for their pool. So I like to include this slide just simply because I'm not sure who has used Prolific and who hasn't. But for those of you who haven't used Prolific, essentially what we are is a place where you can connect with high quality engaged participants and you can feed them through to your surveys. So while Gorilla deals with the kind of study side of the research process, we deal with the participant recruitment side. Uh, we were founded in 2014 by our two founders, uh, Phelim and Katia. And they started the company when they were doing their PhDs at Oxford University. Uh, so we like to think of ourselves because we're started by researchers, specifically for researchers, as the scientific alternative to MTurk. And I'm pretty sure with this crowd, uh, I probably don't need to uh, tell you all about the problems with the MTurk platform. So, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Prolific and Gorilla take part of two different parts of the research, um, take care of two different parts of the research process. So while Gorilla takes part of everything on the study side, we take part of your participant recruitment. And it's for that reason that we kind of operationalize data quality and participant engagement slightly differently. At Prolific, our focus is really on keeping all the participants that are in our participant pool, all 140,000 of them, as high quality as possible, so that when you run your study, you only ever get really good and engaged participants come through to your study. And we do that in three main ways. So the first is the onboarding sequence that we use. So when a participant signs up to Prolific, they all take part in exactly the same onboarding sequence. And the point of this is to familiarize participants with online research, Prolific specifically, but also allows us to measure a whole host of facts about them as well. The second is what we call bank level KYC. So KYC stands for know your customer, uh, but you can probably think of it as verification. Uh, I think that's a much more easy way to understand it. Essentially what we do is we verify every participant that comes onto Prolific. And the reason we call it bank level KYC is because we use the same systems as a bank would use uh, when they're verifying you as a customer. Finally, when participants are actually in our pool and taking part in studies, we don't stop there. We continuously monitor every single account on Prolific. And we also monitor the kind of health of our pool over time as well. And this allows us to kind of weed out any bad actors that we find at that point. 
So I'm just going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail for you now, starting with our onboarding sequence. So as I mentioned, every single participant goes through exactly the same onboarding sequence when they sign up to Prolific. That is, they start on what we call, uh, they start with a wait list. They then move through to what we call the demo study or the trial study. They then have to do their verification steps and then they fill out a whole host of demographic information. Now it's only after they've filled out, completed all four of these steps that they're actually allowed to take part in your research. So I'll go into a little bit more detail about what each of these steps uh, is for you now, starting with the waitlist. So the waitlist is essentially Prolific's initial gatekeeping mechanism. Um, when a participant comes to Prolific and clicks sign up, and then I want to take part in research, they see that screen on the left saying join the participant waitlist. If they join the waitlist, they'll receive an email. Uh, once they've verified that email, they'll see that screen on the right and say you're on the waitlist. Then they'll be on that until they're invited through to Prolific to become a participant. Now, uh, the waitlist serves a whole host of different, uh, different, there's a whole host of different reasons for it. The first re reason really is it's an initial barrier for any bad actors trying to get onto our platform. So on some survey platforms, you may be able to sign up as a participant and within as little as a few minutes, you could be taking part in people's research. We like to stop that happening simply because there are situations where things like bot farms or click farms could identify a high paying study and send lots of participants through to that study. Right? They could get participants to sign up onto a platform to get those high paying studies. That's obviously completely impossible with, with the wait list. The second reason we use it is because it allows us to dig into our participants a little bit before they actually get through to Prolific, which helps keep our quality high. And the third reason, which is really useful to us, is that it allows us to monitor our pool of participants on Prolific. And if we see any of our demographics lagging slightly, so for instance, let's say um, we start to see a drop off in participants from Spain, we can then go through the wait list and actually preferentially invite those participants from Spain so we keep a nice even pool for everyone. Once a participant does get invited to uh, join Prolific, this is the screen they'll, they'll see once they're invited off the waitlist, and they have to complete three steps to actually become a participant. First of all, they need to verify their phone number. Then they need to take the trial study or what we call internally the demo study. And then they need to verify their ID. I'll talk through the kind of verification steps in a minute, but first of all, I wanted to take you through the trial study. So the trial study is essentially just a really short study that we designed internally at Prolific, and it serves a couple of purposes. First of all, it serves the purpose of familiarizing a participant with A, what it's like to take part in research generally, B, what it's like to take part in research online, and C, how Prolific works. So that's all great for the participant, but it gives them that experience, but it also allows us at Prolific to actually measure some things about the participant, which really helps us decide is this participant a good participant or a bad participant. So I'm going to show you a, a couple of example questions from that study. So one of the questions might be this. Uh, I left my keys blank the table. Uh, the participant simply needs to indicate what is the missing word there. Uh, obviously, we want participants to select A uh, on. Uh, and this is a pretty good measure of comprehension and English fluency. Another example might be this. Uh, you've probably all seen questions like this before. It's, it's a pretty standard attention check. Please pick thumbs up. We obviously want participants to pick B here. If they're picking anything else, they're probably not paying that much attention. And then another question that I really like and really actually speaks to participant engagement is this one. Uh, and we've had this in our, in our uh, demo study for a very long time. So participants are given, uh, asked to do a creative writing exercise. They're told to pick two of those superheroes that you see named down there at the bottom. And they need to write, use their imagination, write a sentence or two of backstory or just simply a description of these superheroes. And they're encouraged to be as wild, wonderful, crazy as they like. And they're also given a very specific instruction. Be sure to include the names of the superheroes you pick. They can then literally write whatever they want in that box. And the important thing for us is that we then take the answers that they give and we actually look at those answers and we look at the length of the answer they give and the detail they give and also factors such as did they include the names of the superheroes. So some participants will write a really great story here and it's quite amusing to kind of uh, read what people come up with for the for these superheroes and that will obviously reflect well on their participant account. Some participants, however, might just write either some gibberish or really short sentence or you know, potentially I've even seen people just hold down a single key before. Obviously, if we see any of that, 
it negatively impacts that participant's account. So once they've done the, the demo study, that's when we move on to the verification steps. So to be a participant on Prolific, you need to verify yourself in three key areas. That's your phone number, your email, and your ID. Now the email verification is already taken care of because when they sign up uh, uh, to the waitlist, that also acts as email verification. For the phone number, it's just a simple uh, thing that you've probably all done online with other websites. They need to enter their phone number. They then receive a text to that phone number, which they then need to enter with us. Now, importantly, no two participant accounts on Prolific can have the same phone number. So every single one needs to be unique. And also the phone numbers need to be real phone numbers and not uh, what's called VOIP or internet phone numbers. We don't allow any of those. Then for ID, uh, we actually use a third party provider to, to check participants' IDs. What they need to do is they need to scan a QR code with their phone. That then takes them to the third party provider's app where they need to upload a picture of either their passport or their driving license. And then they need to take a selfie of themselves. All that information then goes off to our third party provider and they come back, they review it and they come back to us and they say, you should let this participant through or you shouldn't let this participant through. If they say you shouldn't let the participant through, then they'll also give us a reason for that. Like potentially the ID looks suspect or um, the selfie may not be correct. Once they've verified themselves though, um, they then move on to the demographic section. So for, for those of you who've used Prolific before, you'll know that we offer well over 250 free pre-screeners to our researchers, which means you can cut and slice your sample any way you want. So for instance, uh, let's say you wanted to do a study on women aged 18 to 30 in the UK who are fans of English Premier League. We have all of those screeners for free that you can use. But the only way we can actually provide those screeners to you is by asking all of our participants a lot of questions. Now, to be a participant on Prolific, you don't need to fill out 250 questions. You actually only need to fill out six. Um, and these are what we call like the, the key questions that we want all participants to answer. And these will be things like your gender, your nationality, your education level, um, your first language, these kinds of things. So this is the screen that participants see. And you'll see that they have uh, six questions they need to answer. Once they've answered those, they're told, thank you for your answers. But then they're flagged that you can now answer a whole wide variety of other screen of questions in the About You page. Uh, and that will help you receive more studies. And uh, the reason it helps people receive more studies is simply because if you give more information to us, it's more likely you're going to be screened into studies looking for specific participants. If they click that link to the About You page, it takes them to that page. And you can see that we categorize all our questions into to different categories. So for instance, so far we've answered six out of 12 of our demographic questions, none of our work questions, one of our language questions. So participants are free to just work their way through this at their own pace. They could ignore this entirely and go straight to the studies, or they could just com complete it all. It, it's totally up to them. Importantly, participants can actually delete their answers on Prolific, but they cannot change them. So a participant can't change their information to be included in a study. We don't allow that at all. Perhaps more importantly, for, for, from a, a quality uh, standpoint, is that we also include some pitfall screener questions uh, in those demographics. Uh, I've given two examples of them over here on the right. So the first one is, are you familiar with the Crispin Buxley phenomenon? Um, any participant that says yes to that, we know is probably not telling the truth because we made up the Crispin Bux Buxley phenomenon. But actually, interestingly with this one, this whole kind of bizarre cult has grown up around this phenomenon now, and there are actually YouTube videos and blog posts about it online. So we're going to be retiring that quite soon because it is actually possible a participant could have heard of the Crispin Buxley phenomenon before coming to Prolific. So perhaps a better, a better example of, of one of the questions we ask is the one below. So this would be in the lifestyle category. And they'd be asked, which brand of tea do you use or have you used most recently? And they're given a whole list of teas, some good teas, some questionable teas there. But one tea, uh, Kempston tea, which doesn't actually exist. So we know that any participant that actually selects that uh, is likely to probably just be answering all the possible answers on each question just to get into more studies. And obviously that's not a good participant and that will reflect badly on their account. But once a participant has done some demographic questions, they're then free to start taking part in your research. But importantly, that's not where we stop checking their accounts. So 
we monitor every single participant account on Prolific for the entirety of the time they are on Prolific. And the main way we do this is through two scores, uh, the approval score and the trust score. Um, the approval score is pretty simple. It basically is the ratio of how many approvals has a participant got versus how many rejections do they have. So if they take part in 100 studies and they're rejected from three, their approval score is 97%. The trust score is a little bit different because a lot feeds into that trust score. So for instance, earlier on, I showed you the demo study. And I said that if a participant doesn't fill out that creative writing exercise very well, then that's gonna impact their account. This is where it impacts their account. So their trust score would be reduced because of that. Or if they fall for one of our pitfall screener questions, that would also reduce their trust score. But it's also based on a whole host of other things. So for instance, we look at participants' IP addresses, and if we consider those to be risky IP addresses, that'll reduce their trust score. We also match the name on their account with the name on their PayPal account that they link to Prolific. If those two don't match, that's another red flag that will also reduce their trust score. And it's important to say at this point as well, as a researcher, you have access to the approval scores for all of your participants. So you can come onto Prolific and say, I only want participants with approval rates of 100% but we don't currently give you access to the trust scores. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see, this is what uh, part of what we see on the kind of admin side of a participant's account. And you can see that this participant has an approval rate of 93%, which on the surface of it doesn't sound that bad, but actually that's, that's pretty low for prolific. Um, nearly all of our participants are at 97% and above. So that alone may be enough for them to um, be removed from the platform. But what's really the problem here is their trust score is minus one, which, which means that they're not trustworthy at all. And you can see that the status of this participant is that they have been shadow banned. We've now actually retired. Shadow banned means that you can no longer take part in studies, but you can still take your cash out of your account. We've now actually retired that and participants will only be banned or allowed on the platform. So that's what we do at the level of the account. Uh, but we also monitor our entire pool across time as well. And the way we do that is with monthly data quality surveys. So every month we get a unique group of 500 of our participants. Um, the only caveat is they cannot have taken part in the survey before. And we measure their attention, their honesty and their comprehension. And the reason we chose those specific uh, measures was simply because we recently published a big uh, data quality paper where we compared these measures across some of the major uh, platform providers, so Enter, Cloud Research, Prolific, Dynata, and Qualtrics. Um, and essentially what we do is we simply measure these the trends in these scores over time. So I've put here the scores for January and February this year, and you can see that attention went up by 4% between the months, which is great. Honesty went down by 1%, which isn't ideal, but it's not too much of a drop for us to be too concerned about it at this point. Uh, comprehension stayed the same, and our overall score went up by 2%. So this is this was good news. It looked like our, 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 our panel was uh, improving. Now, obviously, if we saw any big drop in any of these measures, uh, that would be cause for concern. And that's something we'd immediately need to investigate. So that's pretty much what we're doing at, at, at Prolific behind the scenes to ensure data quality. But there's also a big role for you as a researcher. We really want to encourage uh, what we call human feedback loops um, from our researchers, because at the end of the day, you're the ones that are on the front lines and actually interacting with participants every day. So if there are bad participants in the pool that we need to know about, you're more likely to come across them in some cases. Now, the way we ask for this feedback is there's three main ways you can do it. The first is what we call uh, participant reports. So when you run a study, uh, if you find a participant that you think is suspicious, you can click next to their name, their ID, and click report participant. And you'll see this screen where you're asked for what's the reason you're reporting them and what's your desired outcome? Like, what would you actually like us to do? Now, we can't obviously guarantee that we will do your desired outcome, but this will go through to our support team who will then review each case and, and make the appropriate decision. The second is you can reject participants. Um, rejections have to be made according to some pretty strict criteria on Prolific. We, there's only certain things we'll allow a rejection for because it is quite punitive to participants. If they get too many rejections, they will just simply be removed from Prolific and never be allowed back on. So we do encourage researchers to know what our rejection criteria are and only ever reject participants for those reasons. And the third reason, uh, third way you can tell us is you can simply drop us an email. Uh, if you get in touch with our support team, 
they always want to hear from our researchers if they have any kind of thoughts or suspicions about participants or just general thoughts about the platform. One other way um, that a lot of researchers I don't re think really think about um, when, when they are publishing their research, uh, and this is a good way you can get more engaged participants, is to think about the advert you're putting out there to participants for your study. So you can see that screen on the right, that is the screen that a participant sees when they log into Prolific. All the studies that they have been screened into are available on the left. And if they click one of those, they'll see a little bit more of a description of that study. Now, what you put in that description can actually really impact how good your participants will be, like the quality of your participants and the engagement. You don't want to put too much information, but you also want to put enough information for participants to make a choice. So I've got a couple of examples of, of studies that I found on Prolific. Um, so this one, Beliefs and Technology, the title's not bad, uh, it's fine, it kind of gives your participants a bit of an idea of what they're gonna be doing. The description isn't bad, it could be a lot more detailed in my opinion, uh, but it's not too bad. But importantly, the study is showing is paying £4.62 an hour. Now our minimum payment on Prolific is £6 an hour. So this study is not gonna get very good participants through to it because good participants are not gonna to want to take part. Another example, uh, so this one's called Survey for Experienced French Horn Players. And the first thing to notice is this is paying £8.16 now, which is great. Uh, the description, however, is, is pretty lacking, in my opinion. It's not awful, but it's not great. But the thing that I really don't like about the study advert is the title. So we really encourage our researchers not to give away the demographic criteria they're looking for in their title. So it's pretty clear from one look at this that they're looking for French horn players. The problem with this is that if you do have a bad actor who is scouring studies on the prolific platform, they see this title, they know all I need to do is pretend to be a French horn player and I can take part in this study. So never give away your desired demographics right there in the title. Now, for example, of a good study description is this one. So again, it's a short title, leadership and personality. Doesn't give too much away, but it kind of gives participants a bit of an idea of what it might be about. The rate of pay is brilliant, £8.61 per hour. And then the description is really good. So it gives a nice kind of description of what the payment is, what participants can use to take part, and also what they're going to be doing. So this is the kind of advert that you really want to be posting if you want to get good participants. Now, just to kind of wrap this all up, I wanted to show you uh, these results. So I mentioned earlier that um, we ran a big data quality study for, uh, between some of the major providers. And this is the results for how, when we measured comprehension in that study. Now, comprehension is pretty close of an analog to uh, engagement. So in study one, we compared these five platforms on comprehension as well as some other factors. And in study one, we didn't use any filters on any of the platforms. So we literally went to these platforms. We said, give us 500 of your participants. We don't care who they are. I think we said they've got to be from the US. Uh, but other than that, we don't care who they are. They could be your best participants or your worst participants. When we did that, Prolific came out by far on top. So you can see 81% um, of participants got past both of the comprehension questions. And that was about 30% more than the second place, which was Qualtrics. In study two, we actually applied filters to all of the platforms to try and only get their very best participants. So these are things like approval rates or the number of previous submissions they've had. And you can see that Enter really didn't improve very much. So Enter was rubbish, even if you gave, even if you put all the best approval filters on. Cloud Research, however, did improve a lot and had data quality pretty actually um, comparable to prolific on this, but we still just edged them out. Uh, by a couple of percent with 87% of our participants passing uh, both those checks. Uh, so just to conclude, um, the, the kind of points I want to hammer home is that I think at Prolific, data quality is pretty much our number one priority. It's the thing we're most concerned with and the thing probably our team spend most time working on. Uh, we're, a lot of us are researchers, so we know how important it is for uh, you to have great data quality in your research. It's not only vital for your research, it's vital for science as a whole, and it stops you wasting any of your time and money when you come to us for your, uh, for your studies. Our research does show that our efforts are paying off, but there's obviously always room for improvement, and we're about to run a follow-up to that big data quality paper, uh, which is hopefully going to launch in the next couple of weeks. And this is the point I, I really like to, to kind of hammer home, is that as a researcher, you are actually a part of this. So 
we do want to elicit as much feedback from you, the researchers, as possible, because it actually really does help us keep on top of our data quality and prolific. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions, but just to flag, if, if you haven't heard of Prolific, go to our website and check it out, or I'll follow us on um, Twitter. The other Twitter handle there, Phelan B is our CEO, who posts a lot of interesting stuff. You can also contact me by email. You can follow my Twitter, but I'm going to be honest, I, I barely use it, so pro probably not the best idea. Um, but yeah, if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or ask them at the end. Fantastic. Andrew, thank you so much. It's extraordinary to see the amount of work that goes into keeping a possum fool alive. Um, that we do have some questions in the Q&A, so let's get straight into some of those. Uh, Vivian Rogers asks, if you recruit participants, do you get all the screening information or just the ones you put in as screeners for your study? I'm thinking also the census representative sample option. I'd like to know the language background of those participants. That's a really good question. So you get some information, but not all, which is I'm, I'm, a pretty annoying answer. Basically, there is a set when you complete a study on Prolific and you download the export for that study, you get a set. I think it's about seven or eight different pieces of demographic information. So you'll get nationality, first language, student status, gender and a couple of other things. If you go to our help center, there's actually a list of what it gives you by default. Other than that, you will only ever get information on the screeners that you have selected. Um, one tip I can give you is if you're running a, a survey and you want information on one of our screeners but don't want to screen participants according to it, you can open that screener and just select every single option. And that will basically get you all the participants, but that information will now be included on your data export. So it's quite a nice way to, to get that information if, if you need it. Fantastic, thank you. Um, then the next question I want to, I think a quick one, how do we see what our approval and trust scores are? I think this is from the point of view of a participant. I think you said the trust scores are secret and don't yes. get disclosed either which way. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, uh, if you're a participant, uh, so trust scores aren't, are only visible to us at, at Prolific. If you're a participant, I'm afraid you don't get to see either, but if you're a researcher, you do get to see, uh, you, you don't get to see individual participants' approval scores before you run a study but you can filter by the approval scores of the participant. That makes sense. But if, 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 you're, if you're still getting studies, if you're a participant and you're still getting studies, then you're still in our good books. So be happy about that. Yeah. That's good. Um, there's a couple of other ones which I think you can probably answer in the q and uh, The last one here is like, um, just to clarify, you we're discouraged from placing demographic info in the title, but should we, should, but should we still include it in the description? For example, should I include the description, I want native speakers of a certain language, or do you recommend just purely relying on the screeners for that? I would recommend purely relying on screeners. Um, yeah, you, you should always check um, when you run the study, always validate your pre-screeners within the study. So you could include a question within your study saying something like, what is your native language? And then we do actually allow you to remove participants who fail that screener, i.e. they don't match the, the information that uh, Prolific holds for them. But I would never, I would never say give any information about who you're looking for in the description. Just assume that Prolific's working uh, is doing it in the background, but validate it within your study as well. Fantastic. Thank you. We'll endeavour to get to the rest of the questions in in the actual Q&A panel itself. But now let's move on to our second talk. Uh, Joe Erisher from Gorilla. Joe, do you go? Hey, you're already sharing. That's been great. I think we can hear you. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, over to Perfect. you. Perfect. Brilliant. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Evershed, the founder and CEO of Gorilla Experiment Builder and the host of the Behavioral Science Online Conference. I've been helping researchers take their studies online since 2012, so over 10 years now. So as you can imagine, I've seen a lot of research. As part of that journey, my team created the Gorilla Experiment Builder as a single platform for psychological tasks, questionnaires, games and more. When I was at uni back in 2009, I was deeply disappointed that having been convinced of the merits of behavioural research over survey research, that the tools didn't exist to take behavioural research online quickly and easily. So I was stuck having to learn MATLAB and make do with small sample sizes. So once I left UCL, I set about creating Gorilla so that researchers could take all manner of behavioural research online quickly and easily and without needing to code. Incidentally, that's why we're called Gorilla. It's a bigger and better survey monkey. 
Today, I'm going to talk about the three aspects of data quality that are under your control during the participant experience. And these are the relationship that you form with the participant, the experience that you create for them, and the internal controls that you put in place to identify low quality data. First up, the scientist participant relationship. To get the best out of your participants, you need to treat them like a valued research collaborator, not set up an antagonistic relationship where, they, where you assume they are trying to cheat you. In simple terms, treat participants with respect, assume the best in people, but prepare for the worst, introduce yourself and your research without compromising your research, treat them like humans, not robots, instructions in plain English, not impenetrable scientific language, treat them with respect, design fair retention checks and internal control measures, don't try and trick them, and treat them with consideration, put effort into the participant experience so that it is engaging, rewarding, clear, and even enjoyable. A useful mental model is to think about the relationship between a manager and a worker. You are the manager, they are the worker. Yes, they work for money, but participants also want to feel valued and to have pride in their work. So what is the exchange that's on offer? In exchange for money, you'll get their time and some attention. But you also have other things to offer, which researchers often forget about. You can offer them a rich and well-designed participant experience. You can offer them scientific knowledge that you have that might be interesting or enriching to them. And you can offer them pride in their scientific contribution. And in exchange, they might give you more attention and engagement with your study, and you'll get higher quality data. When you get it right, they'll give you valuable feedback. We all know the stereotype of the poor manager that treats their workers with disrespect, and so the workers do the bare minimum. They only do what they're told and no more. But a good manager engages their worker in the wider vision so that workers feel empowered to contribute, and in exchange, workers do just this. And we want to create the latter environment in our research studies. The big thing you have to offer beyond money is the chance to be involved in the creation of knowledge. And while money is the main motivating factor for participants, the thrill of being in part of meaningful research is also a factor. Consequently, ensure that participants know who you are and what your lab studies and why this is important. You don't need to get bogged down in the detail or compromise the naivety of your participants, but it gives participants a sense of meaning to understand their contribution to the bigger picture. Here's an example of how to do it. Hi, I'm, you put your name, from university, your university, and I work in the, the name of your lab. We study what you study, and ultimately we have our research will, and then the way you make the world a better place. Now this can be quite like very far from your research that ultimately, so it's like I study language, ultimately I want to help children learn how to read better. You, it, it needs to be something concrete that people can, feel is valuable and that they want to contribute to in the world. We thank you for your time today. Our research wouldn't be possible without participants giving their time and attention so that we can understand how the brain works. And one thing I'd recommend you do is have a go at right uh, after this webinar at creating your own perfect intro. Next up, the participant experience for the experiment overall and within the tasks. Obviously, all studies have instructions, but what's press practice here? The weaker version is accurate, but clinical and unwelcoming language, essentially what we're trained to write in our method section. You will be shown 100 images on a scale of 1 to 10, rate each image for aversiveness. But because we want our participant to be a research partner, we want to explain the instructions in a more conversational style. In our experiment, you're going to be shown 100 images in four blocks of 25. This will take about 10 minutes, including breaks. Your job is to rate each image on a scale of one to 10 by clicking on the on-screen buttons. We're interested in how pleasant you find each image, how friendly, funny, delightful, or comfortable, or how aversive you find each image, how icky, scary, horrible, or uncomfortable. Score aversive stimuli low and pleasant stimuli high. And in a different study, we'll be using these images to train an AI to identify unpleasant images so that the AI can be used to moderate online content. This will help keep the internet safe for everyone. Do you see the difference? One is clinical and the other is conversational. And the conversational one is far more appealing. And it's actually also easier to understand because participants can imagine what the experience is going to feel like and look like. Think carefully about how you show or tell your participants what you want them to do. We used to have participant information sheets printed on bad printers and we got used to black and white text-based instructions. But you're on a computer now. 
You could have text, you could have images, you could even have videos showing them what to do, or practice trials, we'll come back to those later. The right combination will depend on your study. We've heard that video instructions are particularly useful by ensuring that participants have to watch them, they can't skip them. They watch them at the pace that you set, so you can highlight the important messages with your voice, and you can show them what they need to do, which is particularly helpful with tasks involving more concept, complex setups like eye tracking. Of course, the best way of teaching participants how to do your novel, the novel computer-based task is with practice trials. So an, a useful analogy here is video games, where players, learn a no, where play, players also learn a novel computer-based task. With video games, we play practice levels, which, which come with additional helpful on-screen instructions. And we can do the same with our tasks. We can have a few practice trials with additional on-screen prompts or with an auditory narr narrative talking participants through the trial. Practice trials allow you to use participant performance to tell if participants have understood the task sufficiently well to give you good quality data. And if they haven't understood the task sufficiently well, you can either exclude them from your data analysis or you could end the experiment early for them. And to save yourself some, some frustration, please remember, it's impossible to distinguish between data that is poor quality because the participant is shirking from poor, poor data because they're genuinely finding the task hard. Assume the best and pay them for the work that they've done. It will cost you far more time and emotional energy to deal with grumpy participants. And your time is also a very real cost. If your task is longer than 10 minutes, build in breaks. What are the options here? The right experience will depend on the duration of your task and the function of the break in your experiment. Are you giving participants time to get up from the computer, get a drink, have a comfort break? Or do you need them to refresh their concentration? If the former, you need them to be able to step away from the computer. But in the latter, maybe they can play a game-based distractor task, which is more fun and you're controlling the experience between participants. If you do need them to step away from their computer, there are some further considerations. You could just have a page with like, take a break written on it, and the particip participant presses a continue when they're ready and they've come back. But what if they take too long a break and get chucked out of the study due to an overall time limit? or take too short a break and don't refresh their concentration. So another way of doing this is with a forced break with a countdown timer, which can't be rushed, and then it takes them back into the main trials. But what if the participant gets delayed by the postman or some other domestic intrusion? So what we've heard is a combination. We heard from one researcher in the US who does hour long studies on MTurk that he gives participants five minute breaks with a countdown timer. And then when this, this five minutes has elapsed, it goes onto a second screen, which participants have to respond to within one minute, one minute in order to progress. Essentially, it's a five minute break with one minute of wiggle room. And this way, participants can stretch, get a cup of tea, get comfortable and come back on time, ready to continue. And in fact, he uses the second bit as a measure of, um, uh, what's the word? Um, how um, attentive the participant is, like if they're timely, have they come back on time? Do they press the button on time? Or are they a more lax participant who comes back right at the end? Another way of maintaining the engagement is with cute animations and rewarding feedback, like you're doing great, coupled with a few fun science facts that relate to your discipline. Jordan Deacon at Birmingham combined these tactics to maintain interest throughout a long vision experiment with about 600 trials. She told us that participants giggled during the breaks and seemed pretty content. So how could you use your study to delight and educate? What do you know about that's interesting? It doesn't have to be directly related to your study, but it could be useful if it's thematically linked. And it's a great way of disseminating findings from your overall research area. Have you ever had that experience of walking somewhere for the first time and it seems to take ages? And then when you walk home, it feels so much shorter. The route hasn't changed, the distance hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed is you you no longer feel lost, and that completely changes the subjective experience. Participants only do your study once, so there's a big danger of them feeling lost. You can reduce this feeling with clear signposts and clear instructions. The main approaches here are a map of your overall experiment, a progress bar for blocks of trials, and feedback within the trials. This is an example of what an experience map might look like. You'd show something like this as part of or after gaining participant consent so that participants understand the different parts of the study and how long each section will take. 
You'll obviously need to find a way of doing this without compromising your experimental controls, but the idea is to give an overall flow of the experiment. The Gorilla Experiment Tree, of course, makes it easy to stitch together these different parts of your experiment into complex participant experience and to know how long each part of the experiment takes with some piloting. In these images, for anybody who's not familiar with Gorilla, in these images, the green nodes are surveys, essentially. Uh, the blue nodes here are tasks and the orange nodes do things like randomization and counterbalancing. So this one has two surveys, a task, then a randomizer, and then another task in these two tasks our counterbalance. Another thing you can do when you are when you have long blocks of trials is to put in a progress bar, which I'm demonstrating here in a video. You can see the progress bar at the top. It fills up as the participant completes the trials. The one thing to know is just because it's useful to have a progress bar in the task doesn't mean doesn't mean it's also useful to have one overall on the whole experiment. That's a false equivalence. Progress bars are useful in long blocks of samey trials, as it shows that they will eventually get to the end. If you have a stopping rule in your trials and a progress bar, be careful not to confuse your participants. It's an easy fix. Just have a clear explanation after the stopping rule has been applied. Otherwise, you might inadvertently confuse your participants that something has gone wrong with the study, and they might worry that they get paid or jump out early, and then you have a whole host of different problems. It's also to put in feedback. So here you'll see a tick and a cross occasionally coming up depending on the answer. And we've got also get feedback based on pace. So here it says go faster because the participant was being too slow. We see a tick when we get it right and we see a prompt to go faster when we go too slow and a cross when we get it, when we get it wrong. Also notice the text in the bottom right here says, oh, I'll go back there, it says part two, part two, the task down at the bottom. Um, showing the participants which section of the overall experiment they are in. If you want to go further, you can start gamifying your research with animations, particle effects, scoring and theming. In this trial, the feedback has been changed to an animation on the response button, a shake for no and a nod for yes. I'll show that one again. When you click on it and it's right, it jumps up and down. That's a little nod. And when you get it wrong, it's a little shake. You can also add particle effects to make the meaning cl clearer. So we have stars uh, for good and smoke for bad. These are universally understood uh, animations. And then by adding a score up here in the top right, we can motivate participants to pay attention and do their best. And all of these uh, effects have been built into Gorilla without having to do any coding whatsoever. You just add the appropriate component onto the screen and it gives you the effect that you're after. Then finally, just by adding some simple theming here, we've just added uh, a cave like background and some boulders in the front and changed our score into a little gem. We can we can embed our cognitive task into a story about a treasure hunter solving puzzles to collect treasures. Everybody gets to be Lara Croft. All, so all of you on the call today would be able to create a game like these with ease using the Gorilla Game Builder. It really is that easy to use. Games used to be out of reach for most researchers because they would cost 20 to 80,000 pounds to develop. I know we used to do that 10 years ago, but not anymore. You can just build it yourself inside a really good research tool. The final part of the triad is the internal controls you put in place to measure data quality, to manage the data quality. It's a sad fact of life that you'll never get 100% data quality, whether you're online or in the lab. You may be excluding uh, participants' data for failing on a range of different measures. You ha could have attention checks, which allow you to screen out bad participants and bots. You could have internal control measures to screen out participants that haven't understood the instructions or are shirking. And you might have a debrief questionnaire to exclude participants that saw through your experiment or were cheating, for instance, on a memory test. Once you accept the need to exclude participants, it makes the process far easier to manage as you simply need to over recruit by 10 to 20 percent and define a way to unambiguously exclude participants whose data doesn't meet your quality criteria. Once you've defined these exclusion criteria, it makes sense to pre-register them so that you can't be unfairly accused of cherry picking your data. But how do you know what the right criteria, what the right criteria are? You need to run a pilot study. More on this later. 
Based on your quality controls, you're going to make two separate decisions, whether to pay participants and whether to include their data in your analysis. And it's important to separate those two ideas in your head. The general rule is that you should pay for the work regardless of the quality, and you don't hire them again if you didn't do, if they didn't do good work. The same way that if you go to a restaurant, you'd pay for the food that you eat regardless of the quality, but you don't go back again if you didn't like the food. So what are the options for identifying if participants are paying attention? I'm going to show you an antagonistic option, a neutral option, and a fair option. The classic version is the attention check or instructional manipulation check. We know that participants don't like them, and it's not hard to see them as assuming the worst in participants and therefore being interpreted as antagonistic. And I find it hard to believe that a question like this on the screen is going to tell much about performance on a much longer behavioral task like the relational reasoning task we saw before. This first, first version on the screen isn't considered fair because there is no cue in here that you need to read these detailed instructions above. What's your favorite color? Red. That seems fair. Why should I have to read this? A fairer version is based on the ticks you read above. What color have you been asked to enter? And this sort of like, well, OK, then I'll read it and I click the answer. But that doesn't really require much of me as a participant. I prefer these types of internal control measures as anti-shirking tasks or bot checks. The idea here is that you're highly confident participants will be able to complete these if they are paying attention and not shirking. In the first task, the participant is shown a silhouette of an animal that my two-year-old can accurately name and has had to type in the name of the animal. So this would be a cat. And in the second task, the participant has to click on a cat in an array of dogs. And again, my two year old can do this task just fine. So most of your participants should be able to get 100% on these tasks. The final type is to ask your participant to describe the start task instructions in their own words. This is a transparently fair question to ask your participants. And in both piloting and your final experiment allows you to identify participants that haven't understood the task. So you do something like this. Later in the experiment, I'm going to ask you to describe the task to instructions to me in your own words. This allows me to make sure you've correctly understood the task. Please do so in your own words. Don't copy the text from the instructions. It's really important I can assess your understanding. And then halfway through your study, you'd say, hey, remember I said earlier, I'd like you to describe the task in your own words. Now's that moment. In your own words, describe what the trials look like and what you're meant to do for each trial. Thanks. And when you're piloting, this will give you feedback on whether your instructions have been clear. And in your final experiment, it will give you feedback on whether the participant understood the task. The normal place to assess participant naivety and cheating is in your debrief questionnaire. You want to find out if the participants guessed your hypothesis and experimental conditions. And you might want to exclu exclude them if they did. And if you're doing memory research, you want to find out if your participant took notes. Researchers doing memory research tell me they just simply explicitly ask participants if they wrote down the answers. The answering honestly won't change their pay. They just need to know for science. And they do get some participants saying, yeah, I did take notes, actually. And then they pay them and exclude them. And that's all fine. And I expect these are the types of things that Andrew would like you to feed back into Prolific, that you excluded those participants for non-performance on an internal control measure but without saying this is an intention check and I don't think I should pay the participant. So just go, no, 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 I just need to let you know this participant didn't meet my quality standards. The final thing to look at is how do we get better at designing and running experiments over time? We don't start out as experts, but set up the right conditions and we can get better. How do you get better? You need feedback. You need feedback from your peers, you need, but most importantly, you need feedback from the participants and feedback from participant data. Feedback is why we run pilot studies. Why only your participants, their data, and their feedback can help you design an engaging, rewarding, clear, and even enjoyable experiment, experience. And as you become more skilled designing the participant experience, you're, the better your first attempt will be. The typical process is shown above. First, you test it on yourself to see if it makes sense. Then your supervisor, who is probably skilled, will review it as well and give you feedback. Then you test it on some of your pilot, uh, some of your colleagues, um, maybe people in your lab or some friends and family members. And then you do a small online pilot. 10 or 20 participants on Prolific to see how a completely naive participant takes to your study. And you'd repeat this as many times as needed until you feel that you've absolutely nailed your participant experience. And you don't always have to test the whole participant experience. If you've got a mixture of tasks, like three or four different tasks that you're stitching together, you could test them individually as well to see, to 
iterate on that faster. Then you'd want to do a pilot to get your power sample to make sure your power calculation is accurate. And finally, you're going to deploy your experiment. There's a much longer talk at the online, a whole session by Emily Breeze about piloting. Um, so if you want to know more about it, watch this here. Um, I think Claire will put the link in the in the chat now. Obviously, doing all of this takes time, but it's worth it for the data quality. One worry about piloting is the additional costs involved. So this slide is to convince you that the additional investment will give you a good return on data quality. Consider a typical small research project. The fixed cost of a postdoc, including salary, overheads, equipment, conference and publish fees in the UK is around £52,000 a year. And on that, maybe this to just run one study on prolific with 80% power, 15 minute study, the prolific and gorilla fees are going to come to around £1,000. So that's our, that's our basic one. And this is making up a very small amount of our budget. Now, if we do a little bit of piloting, so we're going to increase our budget, we're not going to increase the overall budget, we're just going to increase the, uh, the prolific and guerrilla budget. We're going to run one study, but we're also now going to run three to six pilots. We've only increased the total budget by about 4%, but we've increased the investment in our data by 300%. And better data means better research, and better research should ultimately to more, lead to more citations and impact. So it's a really good return on investment. We can go even further. Rather than just running one study at 80% power, why not leverage the work you've done and run three variations on a theme at 90% power? For a modest increase in overall budget, 9%, you can increase the investment in the experiment data by a massive 600%. This is not so much additional work, as, and this is not much additional work as you have most of the study done and most of the data analysis pipeline done, and the studies all go into one paper. So if you already have a grant and there's no budget, there's not much you can do, but you can resolve for f future grant applications to check the percentage being spent on designing the participant experience and data collection and ensure you've got enough for decent piloting and decent sample sizes. For small projects, this might be between 10 to 20% of your overall budget. A useful analogy, underinvesting in the participant experience and data quality is like building a Formula One racing car, a feat, and a feat of science and engineering, just like your research, and then only putting one litre of petrol in it when you could have put in 10 litres in it and gone so much further. So how do you get better at designing at experiment design? When piloting, you can look at data quality, look at attrition and where it happens, ask for feedback at various stages in your experiment when piloting, and ask for feedback at the end of your study. But the main thing to do is ask participants if, they'd, if there's anything else they'd like to tell you. People love to chat. People love to share their thoughts. So ask a question on, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? And once you get good, you'll start getting comments like this in the box. Thanks for including me in this study. I hope the study works out. Good luck with your study. I really enjoyed hearing about your research. These are all signs that the participants are engaging in the research as a partner and not as a cog. So just to summarize what I've shared today, treat participants as a research partner, not a cog. Create an engaging and rewarding participant experience. And I shared several different ways of doing that. Include and pre-register a variety, a variety of data co quality controls, looking at different aspects of data quality and use progressive piloting to improve the participant experience and data quality. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Joe. That's all, those are really, really uh, wonderful bits of advice in there. We are... Um... I just had one question. Can I just jump in? Sorry, yes. one question for all of the everybody on the call today. What, Which of those ideas did you most need to hear today? What's the one thing you're going to take away today and go, that that's what I needed to hear? In the chat now, your one takeaway of what's the first thing you're going to... Um, take away and put into your next study. Um, let people put some answers in there. Um, cool. Um, so we are banging right up against six o'clock. So um, I want to allow a couple of questions if we can. Um, Joe, you mentioned, I think in the middle of your talk, there was, um, uh, you showed tasks and then going into games, obviously we're all familiar with service. Are there any other experiences that as well that you can broaden um, your studies too? 
Yeah, so Gorilla is a research platform that allows you to do so many different types of research. So we've got a multiplayer tool in there as well, which is another way of making your, your studies engaging. People like to be in, in studies with other people. It keeps them focused in a slightly different way. Um, we also have our shop builder tool, so you can do real consumer related research. Um, and it looks really ecologically valid because they, they look like they're in a sort of like amazon.com style shop with products that they can add to the basket and take out so i think it's about thinking of, of using your research tool to create interesting experiences for your participant we don't have to be limited to what we could create ourselves in matlab when we could instead be creating games shops multiplayer experiences because not having to do the coding ourselves gives us the ability to go so much further with our participant ex experience so that we get more ecologically valid data. So much of our lives is spent online now that actually getting participants to behave online is ecologically valid as long as you can set up the experience to look like something they, they could imagine is in the real world. Amazing, yes. Um, fantastic, so as I say, we're like, there was, um, uh, Andrew, there's, was there one more question you wanted to bring from earlier? I know there are a couple that you were holding on to. I think we've probably got time for one. Uh, and then I think we should probably wrap up. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions. Um, I said, well, the questions that are currently in the Q&A, uh, if the people that ask them can, can literally just email me, I can answer that. There's one thing I wanted to um, bring up. I'll put my email in the uh, chat quickly. Uh, one question I thought was interesting that just got posted in chat. Sorry, give me a sec. Was, um, sorry, I'm just scrolling up to it. Uh, Claudia, uh, you said you, you mentioned a question about attention checks in your instructions, um, uh, whether Prolific allows that. Um, essentially, we do allow that, but we don't call them attention checks, we call them comprehension checks. Uh, but it, it, it's quite a kind of, um, the criteria for a comprehension check are quite specific. For instance, if you have a set of instructions and then you ask a participant to demonstrate their understanding of those instructions, they have to be given two chances to answer. Uh, the instructions need to be present at the same time as the question. And also if they do fail it, we ask that you don't reject them. You just We just return their submission for you so they're not penalized. Um, there is one of our help pages is called Prolific's Attention and Comprehension Policy. Um, encourage you to read that and, and that will go through it all for you. Fantastic, thank you. So yes, um, so for both our panelists, um, do please get into, if you have, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't got around to all of the questions, um, but uh, we are out of time. So do, but do feel free to connect them on uh, Twitter or, um, or email them directly. We'll put those contact details in the chat for you now. Sorry, um, there was, um... Can I just say one thing? There yes. was one question, I think, for me, of whether it's pos possible to measure reaction times for um, acoustic responses. So not, yes. not key presses and mouse clicks, but acoustic responses. Claire, could you link up, if you haven't already, the speech, um, the Gorilla Presents we did with all the auditory researchers who did uh, speech production studies? Because I think that would be the right set of answers for Molly. Um, but in a nutshell, it's, it's possible to get... Um, a timing for auditory responses is obviously not as accurate as keyboard and mouse presses. There's a bit of a delay before the auditory um, or how it works. So um, you'd have to pilot it to find out what that delay is um, and then and see what the difference is. But I'm hoping that that webinar will help you. Somebody might have an answer to your question. Fantastic. Um, OK, so. Um, Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, and um, so, yeah, I've put the I put the Twitter handles on there. There are the links from earlier. If um, anyone was trying to um, pop them down and didn't quite get there, um, so um, so yeah, sorry. So Andrew's shown us all the work that goes on behind the scenes to ensure that the entire participant pool remains engaged and trustworthy, so that you have a great supply of participants on tap. And Joe has shown you um, a wide range of uh, really easy to implement tweaks that you can uh, put into a study that will have a really big impact on your data quality, uh, and also how Grilla makes that really quick and easy to do. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to our panelists, uh, Andrew Gordon and Joe Evershed, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, 
Finally, uh, there will be a survey afterwards that helps us make these sessions uh, more useful and, and, uh, and even better. Uh, please fill it out. As you've just seen, it's a really good way of getting feedback so you can uh, do it better in the future. So we are following our own advice. Uh, it's tremendously helpful for us. Um, our next big event is Be Online in the summer. That is on the 5th of July, 2022. Um, if you follow the link there, you can sign up now and register. And finally, the next event that we are running um, is a session uh, with me and others all about the game builder that you just saw Joe introducing uh, in collaboration with our friends over at Sage. Uh, that is on the 25th of May at three o'clock uh, British summertime. Uh, again, look out for that um, and we'll post the links to that one as well. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you very much and good night to everybody. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nick.